Happy Sunday, Dixwell. Um, whatever time it is, wherever you are watching this right now, I just want to, I want to send you greetings of, of love, peace, joy, and happiness that comes from our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. I, um, I wanted to thank everyone from Dixwell Avenue, everyone who has encouraged me, who has been um, there with me as I have been interning this summer. It's my last week, and I, I'm just so grateful for my time with you all. Um, I also want to um, thank Dr. Streets for his patience and his wisdom and just always being there, um, always picking up my phone calls when I call. I, I thank you so much for your guidance this this um, this summer. This has been such an amazing experience. Let us pray. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Today's uh, sermon is based on Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. Um, a little bit beforehand, we find Christ, we find Jesus, um, making miracles, um, teaching large crowds, and then finally having private sessions with his disciples. In verse 21, Jesus is leaving this place to go to a district in which is believed to have a Jewish enclave in Syria, um, bordering northern Galilee. So, so here's Jesus entering another city with his disciples. He's probably tired and wanting to just hang with his inner circle. And from afar, he hears a woman shouting shouting after him. In the Gospel of, of Mark, um, she is noted as the Syrophoenician woman, which establishes her ethnicity more accurately than this Matthew account does. Um, Matthew refers to her as a Canaanite woman, which is a general designation um, for the enemies of, of Israel. By generalizing her, in this account, she is already deemed as other, those people. In Patois, it, it would translate as them people, them. Eh? Um, her mere social determination as other puts a border um, between her and Christ. It, it puts her outside of Jesus' proximity and his inner circle. Not only is she from a different ethnicity, she's also a, a woman approaching or trying to breach a group of men. And so she uses her voice. Here in verse 22, it's written, Just then, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, O oh Lord, son of David. My daughter is being tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her. Even more so, the, the disciples chime in in asking Jesus to send her away because she will not leave them in peace. Not only does Jesus ignore her in her darkest hour, the disciples see her as a mere pest. Their prejudice prevents them from even having compassion for her child who is being possessed by a demon. In other stories, the disciples are often moved to help those in need. And yet, the Syrophoenician woman cries, was heard, but not listened to. Friends, how many of us know people who are heard but not listened to. 
for, for some reason they are discounted because their lives don't matter or because um, their lives don't matter because of how they look or their criminal record or how they smell or because they don't speak English right. You can fill in the blanks. There are those in our society who are heard, tolerated, but not listened to or seen. And in verse 24, Jesus tries to get rid of her uh, as the disciples ask him to. He says to her, he is sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Here, we see a limitation in Jesus' ministry. The same Jesus that will overturn tables in the temple, Jesus who as a human is limited in what my, my teacher um, from Yale Divinity School, Dr. Jennings would say his imagination. He is limited. In his ministry, his ministry is only to the Jewish people. Beloved, today I challenge us to expand our Christian imagination past, past, um, past those we just know, only our people. Let us not limit our good news, our good works to those who we know, our own, but open it to others. In verse 25, she kneels, right? She hears Jesus say this, and so she uses another pro. She, she uses another tactic. She kneels, humbles herself, and says, um, Christ, I need your help, Lord. Please help me. And you think Jesus would help her after this, but instead he continues to dismiss her by metaphorically referring to her as a dog in reference to her othered status, her Gentile status. Yet she knows she is more than a Gentile. Her last appeal to Jesus comes from a different place now. Not a place of lack or arrogance, but a deep knowing of who she is and who she belongs to. She refutes Jesus' um, claim to ministry just to the Israelites in a non-apologetic way. Her rebuttal comes from a place uh, where her inner strength lies. Her inner strength does, does not lie in her social positioning. It doesn't lie in her class. It doesn't lie in her stature. It doesn't lie in her beauty or her age, her education, her brilliance, or her accomplishments. She counters Jesus' limited view of ministry from the fact that she knows she is somebody because she is a child of God. She says, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. In other words, she is saying it is God's responsibility to take care of me. It is God who created me and it is God who's going to take care of me. It is God who will take care of all of us. And Jesus responds to her in verse 28, finally. He says, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is one of the few cases where Jesus heals someone and actually the person heals themselves. The other um, account you'll find is the centurion. Even good people, like Jesus, need some teachable moments. As we are ever growing in this path of Christianity. You know, there's something about a nobody who knows that there's somebody. Not only does 
She creates her own miracle. She creates a miracle for the whole world. Her deep knowing of her value as a child of God forces Jesus to rethink and open his ministry to the world, Jews and Gentiles alike. After his encounter with her, he is never the same. So here's three takeaways I'd like to leave with you. She does not take no for an answer. And she has diverse ways of approaching, but her, her third attempt was where she is empowered from a different place. It's not from a place of lack and it's not from a place of arrogance, but it's from a place of power. She is empowered by her positioning in God and not in society. She knew her value as the child of God and didn't let Jesus limit her miracle making power. I know this seems obvious, but when was the last time you've allowed other people's negative thinking to impact your own thinking about yourself? Maybe you say, oh, I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm too young, I'm too this. I, I'm too, I don't have that degree. I didn't do I didn't do what I needed to do. I don't have that that ability. I don't I'm not divinely uh, ability. I don't have the ability. I'm not normally abled. Or maybe I just can't cut it. Can't nobody, can't nobody tell you or impose those limitations on you but yourself. And it starts in the mind. And finally, what she teaches is us is those who live on the margins with various intersectionalities have considered many perspectives. My teacher, a woman, a scholar, uh, Dr. Dr. Terman, um, teaches us that it is from the margins. It is from the garret that you can see everything that most people can't see. As a person living on the margin in Jewish society, the Syrophoenician woman had a view of the world that incorporated all her intersectionalities. As someone from the margins with all her intersections, she was able to give voice to those people who also share her intersections, and those who don't. Her miracle was not only just for her and her daughter, but her contribution has changed the landscape of the world. Beyonce has, came, has come out with um, an album, a visual album called Black is King. And I will leave you with the last, um, uh, some lyrics from her song, Bigger. From that album it says if you feel insignificant you better think again better wake up because you're part of something way bigger you're part of something way bigger not just a speck in the universe not just some words in a Bible verse you are the living word and you're part of something way bigger, bigger than you, bigger than we, bigger than the pictures that they have framed us to see. But now we see it. And it ain't no secret. I am somebody, my friends, because I am a child of God. It ain't no secret. Beloved, we are somebody because we are children of God. Be persistent in the call that God has put in your life and be persistent in the healing that needs to be done in your life. Because you will not only be healing yourself, but your healing can transform the whole world. You are somebody because you are a child.